Good morning. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. We are talking about healing, the subject of healing, and we have been asking the question, where does sickness come from? And we've looked at several scriptures. I'm giving you scripture because we always must build our doctrines and beliefs on the Bible, not on human reasoning and imagination trying to come up with your own explanation. No, we need to get it from the scriptures. And so I have given you four examples in the Bible where it specifically said that sickness came from Satan. And these four scriptures are Job 2, 7. And it says Satan afflicted Job with painful sores. So we see it came from Job. And then actually I have uh, the second scripture was Luke 13 and verses 11 and 16, two scriptures there, 11 Luke 13, 11. It says that this woman was Crippled by a spirit. If I start reading in verse 10, Luke 13, 10 on a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, verse 11, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. Obviously, that is not the Holy Spirit. That was an evil spirit, a crippling spirit. Spirit. So she was crippled by a spirit. And then verse 16, Jesus said, then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free, free, set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her. So here we see in two scriptures, she was crippled by a spirit and Satan had kept her bound. And then also when we read Acts 10, 38, Acts 10, 38, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were what? Oppressed of who? Of the devil. The devil. For God was with him. So he healed those who were oppressed of the devil. So obviously these who were oppressed were oppressed in their bodies or minds. And Jesus healed them. He healed them. He healed those who were oppressed by who? Not by God, by the devil. So there we have another scripture that says that it was the devil who did it. Also, in these scriptures, we see adjectives that describe sickness or pain. And in Job 2... Seven, Satan afflicted Job so with painful sores. So we see the adjective affliction. Affliction is uh, the description of the sickness. Affliction. And then also you can look at Job 42.10. 42.10. The Lord turned the captivity of Job. Now, that was when he healed him and restored all of his possessions, double what he had. But there you see the descriptive word captivity, captivity. So you see that sickness is captivity. And then in Luke 13, 16, whom Satan has kept bound, should she not be set free from what bound her? So we see 
her sickness or her crippling condition was called bondage. It was bondage. And then Acts 10.38, Jesus healed all who were what? Oppressed by the devil. So they needed healing. He healed them. So he healed them. It would have been in their bodies, mostly also in their minds. There was also deliverance from demons. But what was it described as? Oppression. Oppression. So these adjectives, affliction, captivity, bondage, and oppression. These are all words that God uses in the Bible to describe sickness and disease. You will never see sickness and disease being described as a blessing. And yet, stupidly, there are Christians who will say, well, maybe this is a blessing in disguise. Maybe this sickness is a blessing in disguise. Where is that in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. It is unscriptural. No scripture for it. No scripture in the Bible says sickness is a blessing of any kind. And it is not a blessing in disguise. The Bible calls it affliction, captivity, bondage, and oppression. And if you're the one who is sick or in pain or diseased, you will know that it is an affliction on your body. It is a captivity. It is a bondage. It is an oppression. Those words are truthful descriptions of sickness, disease, and pain. Never can you actually call it a blessing. Never, never, never. Christians have made up the stupidest ideas and they only work, they only say those things, you know, trying to talk religious. But when it comes to actual descriptions, they'll say this pain is killing me. Why don't they say this pain is blessing me? They don't. They don't say, oh, this pain is just blessing me. No, they say this pain is killing me. That's how they really feel about it. It's just when they want to try to sound religious, they try to use the word blessing. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. It's not a blessing. It's not a blessing in disguise. And God never calls it a blessing. It is. Affliction, captivity, bondage, and oppression. And you know that when you are sick, you are in bondage, you are in captivity, you are afflicted, you are oppressed. They are bondage. It keeps you, sickness, disease, and pain keep you from being able to do everything you would like to do. It keeps you from being able to do everything that you would like to do. As a matter of fact, even when you look at the word disease, dis, ease, D-I-S, dis, ease, E-A-S-E. Dis, ease, is broken or lack of ease. Or you could say peace. So even in the word disease, it doesn't describe it as a blessing. It describes it even in the very word that we use in English. It's dis-ease. It's broken ease or lack of ease. Lack of peace. Lack of comfort. So it will always, if it comes to you in a very strong measure, I mean, some diseases you can function fairly normally, even with a disease. But if it goes to a very 
if it starts getting very strong in your body, it produces weakness. And it causes you to not be able to do all the things you would like to do. So in it, the greater the sickness, there is the loss of ability. There is loss of ability. Pain, sickness, disease cause loss of ability. God does not want you to lose your ability to do anything. It loses your ability. It causes you to lose your ability to do things that you want to do. And the worse it gets, it, it keeps you from being able to help and serve as much as you would like to, to serve others. But then it gets worse and then you can't even take care of yourself Or do everything for yourself that you would like to. And then it begins to become a burden on other people to take care of you. Other people will have to care for the sick. And so we see disease, dis-ease is broken ease, lack of and loss of ease, peace, wholeness, strength, loss of ability. So that means disease is a thief. Disease is a thief. For one thing, it begins robbing your money. As soon as you discover you have a pain, a sickness, or a disease. What's usually one of the first things that happen? Well, if you go to the doctor, you have to start paying doctor bills. If he gives you a prescription of medicine, then you have to start paying for medicine. If you have to go to any kind of therapy, treatment of any kind, then you start Paying for treatments. So the first thing that sickness and disease and pain will do, it starts costing you money, which robs you of money you could have used for something better, something else. Robs you of money that you could use for other things. So disease... Sickness, disease, and pain, first of all, begins robbing you of your comfort, your strength, your ease. But then it also begins robbing you of your money. It robs your money. Well, then if you have to go to the doctor, then it takes your time. There's time involved, time to drive to the doctor, time to wait in the lobby, time to go in and see the doctor, and time to drive home or drive to the pharmacy and pick up your prescription. It begins taking time. It could take an hour out of your day or two hours out of your day to go to the doctor. If you need to go to any kind of treatments, therapies, chiropractic help or or whatever, that starts taking time. So to treat sickness and disease, it starts robbing time, which if you are perfectly healthy, your time and money could be used for other things. So disease is a thief. Sickness, disease, and pain all three of them together. They are thieves. Disease, it steals your, it causes a broken ease and causes loss of ease, comfort or peace, strength or ability to different degrees, sometimes 
less loss of ability, sometimes greater loss of ability. But it begins immediately, as soon as you feel it or recognize it, it immediately begins costing you money and time. Money and time. And of course, then you could say it robs your health. It robs your strength. So disease, sickness, and pain are thieves robbing your peace and comfort, your ease, robbing your strength and ability, robbing your time and money to treat it and take care of it, going to the doctor, going to treatments, getting medications, which your time and money could have been used for something else. So, and then, of course, it robs your overall health. Disease is never a blessing. Never, never get so deceived and mixed up in perverted religious explanations to try to say that maybe your sickness or disease is a blessing in disguise. Absolutely not. It is not a blessing in disguise. It is a thief. It is a thief. And the Bible calls it affliction, captivity, bondage, and oppression. And so that is what sickness and disease is. Remember that disease is always an enemy. Disease is always an enemy. And I'm going to come back to that again in a moment. Disease is always an enemy. But yesterday I took you, I I asked the question, That so many Christians and even non-Christians, it's amazing what unbelievers have heard the stupid religious mixed up ideas that are not even true. People say, well, what about Job? Well, what about Paul's thorn? And they may know nothing else about the Bible, but they've heard about Job and Paul's thorn. It is crazy. But that's because these are all wrong interpretations of the Bible. And so yesterday I took you to the scripture about Paul's thorn in the flesh. And we asked the question, what about Paul's thorn in the flesh? Was it from God? The answer is no, no, absolutely no. Well, did God allow it there again? Just like Job, it was not God who allowed it. Let's go to second Corinthians 12 verse seven. It says in the King James, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh Now, if you stop right there and you don't read any further, it says there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And so then you would ask, well, who gave it to Paul? And if you would stop right there and not read any more of the verse, you might say, well, maybe God gave him the thorn in the flesh. But you cannot stop in the middle of the verse. Don't stop. There's a comma. It's the middle of a verse. It's the middle of a sentence. And it goes on to say, who gave him the thorn in the flesh? There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of who? Satan. Satan, it says right there, the next phrase explains where the mess, where the thorn in the flesh came from. It was a, and what it was, a messenger of Satan. And stupidly, there has been, 
There have been theologians and preachers try to explain the thorn in the flesh. And some have come up with this crazy idea that it was some eye disease. Because they jump over to the book of Galatians and they read a scripture that does not say Paul had an eye disease, but said that the Galatians would have given him their eyes if they could or or if need be. To me, that does not say he had an eye disease. It simply meant that the Galatians would have given him anything. They would have given him anything they could to help him. And it never says he had an eye disease. So to make up an eye disease is out of scripture, out of scripture, not scriptural. And then they would try to link that imaginary eye disease in Galatians, which does not say eye disease, back to Corinthians and say that that was the thorn in the flesh. Well, you cannot twist scriptures and take scriptures out of context and take a scripture from one book of the Bible and link it to a scripture in another book of the Bible and put them together and try to say they fit. They don't, not unless they're saying the same thing. Clearly, the Bible is very direct. Don't ever try to make up implied meanings. Don't look for implied meanings. Look for direct statements. What does it actually say? The Bible is literal. Literal. It is literal. Except for, of course, you know, the prophecies and where it uses picture images. And you know, because it's a picture image, that it's a symbolism. Except for those kind of things, these scriptures are all literal and to be literally interpreted. Now, thorn in the flesh is obviously a figure in the speech, a figure of speech, thorn in the flesh. Obviously, if it was a literal thorn, all he would have had to do was take a needle and dig it out. So obviously it wasn't a literal thorn, but that is a figure of speech. Thorn in the flesh is a figure of speech. Today we we might say something like pain in the neck, but what is a pain in the neck? It's a bother. It's a harassment, an interruption, a trouble. This is just a bother to me. It's a pain in the neck. This is disturbing my life. And so that's what it is. Thorn in the flesh. But whereas that is, is a figure of speech. It goes on and then explains what it was. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. Now the messenger of Satan is one sent by Satan, sent by Satan to buffet me. And As I said, other translations, the um, New American Bible says to beat me and the NIV says to torment me. The New English says to trouble me. So there it is, trouble and torment and buffet. So there is the meaning, troubling, tormenting and buffeting. So. What is it? You have to read it in context. This was a letter written to the Corinthian church. And so there are no chapter breaks. Take out the chapter division and go back a few verses to the last part of chapter 11. And he begins talking about all of his sufferings, all of his sufferings from verses 23 to 27, especially, he says, I have been in prison. I've been flogged, exposed or uh, to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews, 40 lashes minus one, beaten with rods, stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, spent a night and a day in the open sea and danger from my own countrymen and danger from Gentiles. And remember, I said yesterday, there were actually Jews, Pharisees that 
followed him city to city to stir up trouble wherever he went to preach. He would go into a city and the Jews would follow him and start causing the people of that city to turn against Paul to start a riot and turn against Paul. That was the demonic spirit, demonic spirit, messenger of Satan sent to torment Paul, trouble Paul, beat Paul everywhere he went. Everywhere he went, there was trouble. Everywhere he went, there was, there was persecution. And it was a messenger of Satan, even using these Pharisees and these Jews to go city to city to cause trouble, to cause riots and persecution to come against Paul. And it was not only from the people, but it was even the shipwrecks. It was being spent a day and a night in the sea. Everywhere Paul went, there was a messenger of Satan stirring up trouble. That was Paul's thorn in the flesh. It was the trouble that followed him everywhere he went. A messenger of Satan, not sent by God. Well, I'm out of time again. I want to invite you, if you're blessed by these radio programs, to support this radio program with your offerings. And you can write to me at Victorious Faith, P.O. Box 509, East Lake, Colorado, 80614. Join me next week. And remember, God loves you. You're blessed and highly favored by the Lord.